So for those of you who uh, don't know me, uh, I'm the CTO of Arista Networks. I've been working in networking for probably 20 plus years now. But my first love is software. I'm really a programmer at heart. I've been programming all my life, program for fun. You know. So when we started at Arista, we started off with the mission to build a programmable switch. Because if you're a networking guy who loves programming, what could be cooler than the switch that you can like, add your own software to? And people were like, well, why would anybody ever want to do that? And we didn't really know. But the vision for the company was networks that work better because the customer has their own software running alongside ours on the switch. It took about 10 years, but it became true. And today, all of our very largest customers all have their, some of their own software running on our switches, which is really quite amazing. And you know, there are not a lot of companies that do this, but they buy a lot of switches. So it's worked out actually very well for us. So I wanted to talk about EOS and programmability and how we've enabled this. Um, it, it really starts with the architecture. And so the EOS architecture actually is different than traditional switch operating system architectures. I want to talk about some of the architectural differences, and I'll show how that leads to programmability, how it supports programmability. Oh, by the way, I love questions. So, so please just interrupt and like challenge me, or I'd really like to get a conversation going as much as possible. We start off with a single binary. This is such a huge simplification for our customers to have one image to deal with, one version of all the control plane and management plane software, consistent feature set. I like to say that uh, rather than focusing on having the same bugs in each version of BGP, we have the same features in BGP across all of our platforms. Okay, so we'll put it that way. Um, and uh, ha having this one binary means there's one thing to qualify, one thing to distribute to all your devices. And we can standardize on this across your entire environment. and really simplifies things a lot. Um, second architectural principle is state orientation. This is the idea that the behavior of the device is driven by the state in the database. And the state in the database reflects all of the status of the device. There's no need to poke the device and tell it to do stuff. You simply put state in the database that then governs the device's ongoing behavior. And likewise with status. And by having this uniform state-oriented approach, we've enabled not only on-box programmability, but also off-box programmability, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. And the third principle is true Linux. We run the same Linux on our switches that we run on all of our servers within Arista. This is off-the-shelf open source distribution. And so by having true Linux on the box, we have a, the, the foundation of a platform that a huge community is already very familiar with. It's probably pretty obvious how that helps support programmability. So the, the single image means that when you, um, by having one image, insofar as the customer invests to get their own code running against that image, that investment is leveraged uniformly across all of our platforms. Imagine trying to make a system programmable when you have 39 different versions of your operating system running across you know, I mean, not, not, not just versions of one operating system, but you have four or five or six major operating systems running on your networking devices. And then it's just, you can't even imagine how this would be possible. So single image is really an important foundational element. And state orientation means decoupling. It means that customer code doesn't get tied up in threading and locking and all the sort of issues you get with RPC and timeouts and retries and, and failures. With state orientation, customer code actions on the box just go straight to the database. And that sort of atomic operation is the right primitive to get sort of um, a high degree of control without a high degree of coupling at a control flow level, if that made sense. And then true Linux, as I already mentioned, means that we've got familiar tools, familiar architecture. Customer already has a robust development environment for, for building that kind of software. So it makes things just much easier for the customer to adopt. There are actually now five different programmability platforms in EOS. And I'm going to do a slide on each of these. This is kind of a summary slide, more for reference. I'm not going to you know, belabor this slide now, because all the content on it I'll cover in the next five slides. The first programmability, programmability platform is called EAPI. These are the external APIs for EOS. And by external, what I mean is the software that, that the customer is creating to automate their network is running outside the switch external from, from our box. So you can write the software and run it anywhere you want on your management platforms. And uh, 
I've got some example code. I apologize for the spacing. I actually do know how to indent Python properly. It's just uh, the PowerPoint to you know Google Sheets kind of conversion. Anyway, the, um, the, the this is an example program. This is actually a complete program in EAPI, Python, and you can see how simple this is. That you just connect to the server, which is the switch, with your username and password, and then you have one API function, run commands, which takes a vector of character string commands to run. What's wonderful about this is that you already know how to use it, right? You want to use EAPI to extract all of the LLDP neighbors of the box? If you're going to use somebody's bizarre, you know, uh, XML APIs, you might find it on page 937 of the XML guide somewhere. If you're using EAPI, you already know the command. Show LLDP neighbor. Hey, imagine that, right? So um, there's a little EA, EAPI explorer built into the switch. You can type in, it basically shows you this kind of shell of, a, of what a script would look like. You type in the command you want, hit return. It shows you the JSON that will come back so you can see exactly where and how to extract the information that you want from the command. What's great about this is so easy to use. And it does everything. You have access to all of the state of the, the box. Anything you can get from the CLI, you can also get through EAPI. Do you always get JSON and some kind of structured data back? Um, most commands give you JSON back. Yeah. There are some sort of platform debugging kinds of commands that will give you an ASCII dump that you have to go parse through. But for all the standard stuff, you want to look at IP routes or counters or interface status or any of that kind of thing, you'll get back a, a JSON document. Other plans to support a native RESTful API? We have four more platforms to go through, so I'll, I'll uh, be happy to, to readdress that question after I've had a chance to go through the others. Um, so uh, um, this gives you both config commands as well as show commands and also exec commands. You can do any of them through uh, EAPI, and it's just a really great way to automate common management operations. Config session so that you get the rollback if you do something wrong. Yes, absolutely. You can have a whole series of commands. As I mentioned, it's a vector of character mm -hmm. string commands. Oh, okay. You enter a session. It, it, you see where the square brackets are around mm -hmm. shoulders? Sure. There's a whole list there of you know, entering a config session, doing a bunch of commands, and commit, or roll back, or whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, what's not ideal about EAPI is all those nice things I said about state orientation. They're kind of not really relevant here, because this is fundamentally just CLI commands, like in the CLI from the 1970s, or whatever it is. And so it's just got all the idiosyncrasies and sort of inconsistencies of that CLI, uh, plus it's purely a kind of request response kind of interface. So it's sort of, you ask for something, you get it, but then that's kind of the end of the relationship. And that's just because that's the nature of the CLI, right? So more sophisticated applications that need stronger state synchronization or streaming will use one of the other four uh, platforms I'll talk about next. The second one is OpenConfig. I'm very excited about this. We've always wanted a standardized, programmatic way to access switches, but we didn't feel like we had the sort of industry pull to make a cross-vendor standard succeed. Fortunately, Google and AT&T do. So, OpenConfig. OpenConfig is gRPC-based, it's customer-driven, it's well-standardized. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, its name is OpenConfig, but actually what's most interesting about it to me is the streaming status element that you can subscribe in OpenConfig to certain paths in the OpenConfig hierarchy, and as that state changes, state updates are streamed to you. The streaming state update model, I love that model. That's how EOS works internally, so it's a great fit for us with the OpenConfig model, and I think it's the right interface for people to write more sophisticated back-end applications. Yes? So, amount of models provided by OpenConfig is limited, often incomplete, and completely out of your control. Are you planning to deliver your own native young models that could be used for missing parts? Well, certainly OpenConfig creates that possibility, right? We can do deviations on standard models or just create our own models. So we, we can certainly do that. And it, although you may notice that's on the bottom of my slide here is models needed, which is the drawback of OpenConfig is what you're getting at there, which is that insofar as the model is standardized, so as far as it being out of my control, I don't have any problem with that. The people who are doing the, the standards work here, I bless their hearts, they're doing a very nice job and we're very happy for their service, and we don't particularly need to have control. Um, but there is an issue with completeness, which I think is what you were getting at, which is just this aspect that there's all those internal state ASIC counters, um, Arista-specific features, where there may not be an open config model. And that is very definitely a problem with open config. When you do need to get at things that aren't in there, 
you know, this, it's, just, it's just not complete. So, so um, then you have to pick a different modality to get to that state. Device models that go into augment open config model specifically to your hardware and software. Sorry, I didn't device models specifically to your own devices. And I mean, we're implementing the standardized models, and as it, as we implement them, they absolutely reflect what's going on in our hardware, right? So, insofar as you're looking at counters, you're looking at BGP uh, information, next tops, you have the, the rib and the, the fib, and so on. You're very much getting exactly what's loaded into our hardware. So that that connection is there. Yeah. Um, so we, we hope that this uh, effort will uh, continue to gain momentum. This seems like a much better way to access the state of a device than, say, SNMP polling, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, um, so uh, we're, we're big supporters of, uh, of open config. The third uh, access modality or sort of programming modality for our switches is NetDB streaming. This is sort of an interesting one. So um, our state is in our system database and our switch is streamed out via NetDB. And so we've been using this internally for various things. We've also exposed it to the customer. So we have a gRPC-based protocol that delivers every update to switch state. So this is complete. To, to your point about the incompleteness of open config, which is correct, that's addressed here. That insofar as you're willing to use our schemas, NetDB is, the NetDB schema is defined by Arista, right? All of the state is there. And so we have a smallish number of customers who have gone ahead and implemented a back end for this. This is a, uh, an ingest gateway that they've provided that uh, consumes the NetDB stream from each of our switches and then loads that into the customer's own proprietary big data sort of back end on which they can run their own analytics and visualization. They have a full history of all the state and all their devices. They can say, what did change in, in my uh, IP routing tables you know, two weeks ago Thursday? They can answer those kinds of questions. They can do uh, analysis of um, sort of trending counters, capacity planning, anomaly detection, uh, event correlation, all that stuff they can do on top of their own backend system using their own tools. And obviously, this is for um, sophisticated customers who are, who are using this. Yes? So the first one is easy. That's Python. Yes. The second one is doable. It's well documented. It's public models. That's right. Uh, is this like private thing between you and the customer? Or is this open and documented? Um, well, it's, it's certainly not documented. OK. <laughs> Isn't that open? the question? Well, we're not keeping any secrets. So it's, you know, but, but it's, it's not for the faint of heart, right? So this okay. is, you can certainly look at the path names. The path names are all, they all come out as ASCII paths. It's, it's reasonably clear what a lot of the stuff is. It's not clear what everything is. And you know, we're, we're happy to have those conversations where that makes sense. And if, if this, obviously, if adoption of this picks up to a dramatically larger number of customers, then we'd be much more inclined to produce the kind of documentation to scale that out. But it's a fairly small set of customers that are really capable of creating the software to receive these streams mm -hmm. and then load it into their own, their own sort of big data backend. So, so if someone wants to do it, you're very open to anyone exactly. doing this. That's exactly the right. And there's no NDA to sign in blood to get the data structure. <laughs> um, I don't think we've been particularly concerned about that. So sharing what they're creating in this particular NetDB streaming? Um, I am not aware that they're doing that. And our customers tend to regard what they're doing, the details of what they're doing here, as their own competitive advantage, and actually tend to be fairly secret. Well, different customers have different degrees of secrecy about it, but I wouldn't say there's a lot of collaboration, as far as I'm aware, uh, going on at this level. When you stream over open config models, would you use GNMI, which is interface defined by Google for open config, or use your own representation for NetDB? Um, sorry, you asked about, asked about open config or NetDB? I'm open confused. config, but... For open config, we're using Google's representation. So, For, for, NetDB, be, we're, for the NetDB streaming, we're, we're doing our own... It's gRPC-based, but it's our own gRPC protocol. Would you use GNMI if you use open config? I, I believe we... Ryan, do you know the answer to this? I believe we're using Google's encoding of open config, but I'm actually not sure. Do you know which open config encoding we're using offhand? OK, I'm sorry. I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, so uh, you know, our, our uh, big web operators have been able to turn off SNMP completely on their devices because of uh, NetDB streaming, which is pretty cool. The fourth interface I want to talk about is turbines. So what we've done here with Cloud Vision is we've made Cloud Vision itself a back end for receiving NetDB streaming. 
So your own on-prem Cloud Vision deployment can receive streams of state from all of your switches and store that state in HBase. So you have a historical record of all switch state over all time. And then the Turbine's API, so we have our own telemetry apps that run on top of that. A Cloud Vision telemetry will give you graphs and uh, syslog correlation and a bunch of stuff searching. Um, but in addition, to, to emphasize the programmability aspect of this, we have the Turbine's API, which is an API on top of which you can write what are sort of little state machines. It's, it's kind of like, um, it's probably most like Apache Spark. It's kind of stream processing. So we'll sort of feed your Turbine state updates as they come in, and then the Turbine generates derived state and then writes that back into the database as well. So you're effectively doing your own state aggregation, trending, statistics, analysis, pattern searching, just cleaning, like turning data from one sort of an irregular format into a more regular format. There are a lot of things you can do in these Turbines APIs, on top of which you can then do a WebSocket SCUI and, uh, and visualize whatever the data is that you've generated in your Turbine. So what this lets customers do is, uh, is build on top of the big data platform that we've created in Cloud Vision to do analytics and uh, analysis of the, of the historical state of their networks. This is a little bit experimental right now. We don't have anybody actually using this. This is something we're kind of actively building, but it's, the, our, um, it's still, I think, a very interesting uh, potential platform. So EOS, in this case, would be like NetDB collector, and it would store raw NetDB data in some sort of time series database. And then this Turbines API would allow me to do some aggregation or cleanup or filtering or whatever and store that data back into your database so that you could then use the graphing that you already have to present my data in the way I wish it to see. That was all exactly, exactly right except for one thing. It's not EOS that holds the data, it's Cloud Vision. Yeah. So Cloud Vision is actually a different platform. So EOS is running on all the devices yeah. okay. and then it's Sorry. a different operating system. It's a different configuration on, yeah. on the... Uh, on the big data back, it's a scale out, you know, Linux backend. Other than that, I was exactly right. Okay, great, so the fifth platform is EOS SDK. And so I've been presenting these platforms in sort of the order of the amount of sophistication that I think they mm -hmm. require on the part of the customer to, to make use of them. Maybe three and four were backwards, but this one is certainly requires the most uh, sophistication. EOS SDK enables our most sophisticated customers to create their own C++ code that runs directly on box with full access to the system state database, reacting to the same kinds of events, control plane packets or control plane events, link downs, route changes, whatever they want to react to, and then update the control plane through the database, loading their own static routes, ACL entries, policy routes, uh, manipulating interface configuration, really doing anything they want uh, through their own code. And this enables our customers to effectively create custom control planes. Their own approach to routing, their own approach to egress peer engineering, their own approach to traffic engineering, segment routing. Uh, those are all some applications that are DDoS mitigation and protection. Those are some of the things that our customers have done by being able to program directly on top of EOS SDK. So you write your own code, you compile it against a stub library that we provide that lets you run and test your code off box you then take the same binary, relink it against the production EOS SDK library, which is on box. At that point, you're connected to the actual system database and you're live in the actual network. So again, there are not too many customers who use this, but it's been actually very high impact in, those, in, in some of the world's largest data center IP networks and even wide area networks as well. So it, and maybe I'll go back to the question about RESTful APIs. Um, I'm not sure any of these is exactly what a traditional RESTful API is. We're not doing the kind of HTTP, you know, get this thing, HTTP get that thing, HTTP set this thing. We, we kind of view the eAPI kind of covers that aspect of things in a way which people are already familiar with because it's just CLI commands. Um, and then for the more sophisticated programmers who want to really engineer a distributed system, I actually don't believe that kind of get and set as RPCs over HTTP is really the right way to build kind of a coordinated distributed system out of switches and controllers. I think you're much better off with state streaming. And that's where I feel like the right primitives are the NetDB streaming, which I illustrated, and then the EOS SDK mechanism, if you really want to get close to the metal. Over NetConf, ResConf. Well, we looked at the uh, NetConf world and 
there I, I just felt like the, the standardization of the models wasn't at the level that it needed to be. I didn't have a lot of customers asking for that. There's a lot more interest in, in the open config approach. Models, but why not use NetConfast Transport instead of gRPC? Um, it, that's certainly something that we can do. And I, I, maybe I don't have a great answer for this question. I think it's really good customer demand based. And that's the way people would like to access the, the, our existing models. I think that sounds like it's pretty straightforward to do. Performance. And uh, Young push is nowhere close to gRPC. I look at it just, you know, ado adoption, right? How many clients exist today for gRPC? You know, the, you know, NetConf, NC client, things exist out there to consume NetConf interfaces across, yeah. across devices. gRPC is still, still really, I would say, young. I don't call it immature, but it's, it's young from an adoption perspective. Sure. And it would just be nice to have either RESTConf, NetConf, consuming those Yang models on the device versus gRPC, which you know, doesn't have any off-the-shelf open source clients that are, that are widely available today. Okay, that's a fair point. And you know, I think that, again, from my point of view, this really comes down to what are the customers I'm working with closely asking for. And at this point, it's actually gRPC, um, because the, the, but these are obviously a small number of customers. Yeah. RESTful API, you can Nginx on their box and write your own. Sure. <laughs> so what, what, what would... <laughs> so what, why not? <laughs> yeah, so is there, is there like an ideal recommendation for a programmatic approach to config management? Is it, is it EAPI, in that, I guess, in that sense? I, it depends what you're trying to do. For config management, of course, Cloud Vision natively provides a, a pretty robust config management system using a template-based system for generating configs so you can easily kind of change the configs of lots of boxes. And for a customer who, who really wants kind of a turnkey solution, I think that's actually a really good path for them. At the next level, if you're trying to program, programmatically generate configurations, I think you're best off with EAPI. EAPI as a way to push configurations is really straightforward. You just copy the, put the config, put, you know, config replace, and then just the whole config and then commit and like, that's how you push the config. It's just one, EA, one EAPI call. And so... It just seems like it's the direction that most, you know, most folks are trying to migrate to an object-oriented world. We talked earlier about command to the device JSON back. It seems like where most folks are going is, you know, JSON bi-directionally, JSON to the device. Or you can, you could, you can, you can leverage, you know, modern traditional APIs for that. And with Yang models, it's possible with RESTConf, so it's just interesting to see the direction you're taking with, with off-box automation. Well, let's see, I would first point out, and maybe this is a little bit flimsy, but that the EAPI approach is JSON-based, that both the... Um, sure, I mean, the, the, the box status comes back in JSON form and the configs are just CLI commands. Uh, I think people have been, at least in networking, have been trying to go that direction of using JSON as a configuration interface for a long time. And I think the reason why they're not succeeding is there's a chicken and egg with adoption that until people really adopt it, there's not a lot of motivation to provide it. And as long as there's not a lot of motivation to provide it, you don't end up doing the JSON models for new features on day one. And that means the JSON approach is always incomplete. And that means a customer who needs to configure that hash polarization register and the switch ASIC, you know, whatever it is, the sort of off the beaten path feature. Well, I, I got to configure that too, right? Like if, it's, if, it, if it handles 95% of my config, that's great, but it's just, it doesn't work, right? In order to have a fully automated system, it's got to handle 100% of the config. So there's no value until you get to 100% and it just never gets started. And so I feel like EAPI kind of breaks that log jam. And I'm not really sure I'm clear on why you'd be better off with an with a JSON interface to the config of the box, I'm just not seeing it as a lot easier at the level of my Python script that's trying to automate, let's say VLANs, right? So imagine you're doing, I don't know, bare metal hosting so I can, as a, or sort of bare metal as a service, right? So I can like, as a customer, I can like reserve some servers and they get assigned to me. When they get assigned to me, it change all their VLANs, right? So I'm gonna go and set the VLAN for each port. Like I could do that via some sort of JSON interface or I could do it with EAPI where the command in square brackets there is interface ET16 semicolon switch port access VLAN 49. And like you say, look at that CLI command and say, well, that's kind of ugly. Like I'd rather have this JSON XML document or whatever, JSON or XML, until you've looked at an XML document. And then you realize I don't want that at all. And maybe JSON is better, but like still there's a lot of syntax there and you already know the CLI syntax and it just seems easier.
So that's, that's kind of why we haven't gone that direction. And the reason would be because you happen to have the data in a data repository and it's easy to, to export it as JSON than it is to say, okay, now I need to take that and create this text string, which is the CLI command that I need to push to the box because that's all it knows. So you're saying that if, if I have the data, if I, as a person doing the automation, have my own database with the data I want, it's easier for me to push it as JSON? That would be true as long as my model matches the switches model, right? But if it doesn't match, I'm going to have to convert it anyway. If I'm going to be converting it, I'm not sure it's really that hard to stick the VLAN number and the port interface name into a string with, you know, quote, interface percent S semicolon switchboard access VLAN percent D, quote, percent, you know, the two parameters, right? So it's, it's like, it's pretty easy to do that. I mean, I'm not saying it's hard to do it with JSON either, but I'm just saying that the point you've got to convert models, it's not really going to be very different. I, I'm pretty sure we're, you know, we've got a sort of a six of one, half dozen another here. There's another thing. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, why did we start with this whole NetConf REST API stuffy? And it's because we couldn't just replace the configuration. When, if you have to change the configuration of your web server, you change the text config, you reload the web server, and bam, you have the new web server. We never were able to do this on the network devices because they crashed on us. <laughs> if you can do config replace and it works, right, right. why bother? Working exact, thank you, the working config replace is right. an important ingredient in the kitchen here. There are features in EOS that make it okay not to have a true RESTful API. Hmm? Because sessions exist, config replace exists, having, having you know, the ability to do an atomic replace is nice. So I think that's what makes it okay in this case, but we're still stuck on CLI commands to a certain extent. No, it's why I, think, I think it's a great API for network engineers to get started with, yeah. but it's just the general direction. Again, Yang models, you know, in terms of you're only exposing transport via gRPC today, but you know, it, ju it just seems like the ideal situation is RESTConf API exists. So you know, do, do a get and return the serial number. And you can, you can limit the response based on how you construct the URL to the device. And you know, it's, 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 again, it's a modern RESTful API yeah. in that case. But if the models exist, it's just a matter of exposing it via, via different transport types. But that should be straightforward for us to yeah. do, although I'm, again, a little, little far from the details on that. Ideally, you want to push configuration. You want to push data model. And your configuration should be rendered from the data model, not the other way around. Right. Well, we don't. So in, in that world, we have, as I mentioned, some Cloud Vision features for that. But if you're doing your own rendering, then the output of that rendering would just be the text CLI in our, in our environment. All right. I think that's well, one more thing I wanted to mention, which was I, I'm really excited about Cloud Vision. I just wanted to sort of get this out there, which is this, this idea that by providing, I feel like the industry has done some really great stuff creating multi-vendor, interoperable, end-to-end, -end, federated, separate administrative domains of control, data path, and control plane. And then on the management plane, we just, you know, here's your CLI, here's your SNMP stack, oh, an open config, which is really just a better expression of the same fundamental constructs. Where's, where's the distributed system? Right. Like, I've got a distributed data path and distributed control plane. Why is my management plane device by device by device? And so I feel like with Cloud Vision, we've been able to, be able to get all the state into one place and provide the programmability so that you can have the applications on top, have the ability to iterate on the management plane, provide new features and functions without touching the devices. It's just going to be very powerful. So I, uh, I'm hoping there'll be some really neat stuff to talk about uh, in Cloud Vision next time. All right. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your, your time and attention.